We've been answering the question, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? What is a human being? And we saw in our very first time in the scriptures in Genesis 1, Twenty-six through thirty-one, all these wonderful aspects of what it means to be made by God in His image, and we saw that very first day that one of the aspects of being made in the image of God is to be made male and female. God made human beings to reflect His image. He makes them in His image so that we would be a display of who He is. And that work isn't complete until we are equally human but distinct in being men and women. Very intentional in creation. It's so important that we start here. We live in a society where often gender is said to be a sociological imposition on us. And we should have the right to determine, define our gender for ourselves. And that doesn't come from anything but biology, which, by the way, can be fixed pretty easily with surgery and some hormone treatments. So uh, what does it mean to be made in God's image, but made very distinctly and intentionally male and female? Well, we need to see that this is the result of creation. This is not the result of mere biology or psychology or sociology. This is a profoundly theological truth that's grounded in creation. That male and female is the result of a divine creator who's wise and good with an intention in creation that he be glorified. And a key element in this is being made male and female. Until this was the reality of humanity, God did not say it's very good and just what I want and I can take a Sabbath because there's nothing to add to it. And so it had to be this way for it to be everything God wanted it to be. And so we need to start there and realize that creation this doctrine of creation is what leads to this reality of being male and female, made in his image for his glory. Um, so, first thing I want us to do is step back and say, this is a massive issue. It's massively important because it's not just about how we do things or who does what. This is about creation. This is about the intention of creation. This is about God getting the glory he wants from humanity made in his image. And so we back up when we start, okay, this isn't just a, a, a real practical issue. This is a profoundly theological issue. That male and female is intended by God in creation. And this is something that he delights in. He loves this. And we should too. We should love being men and women to the glory of God. We should rejoice that he's made us distinct in this way and unified at the same time. So this is a character of God issue. This is a glory of God issue. This is a doctrine of humanity issue. If you're going to get God right, you need to understand the humanity he makes that's intended to reflect his image. So. Uh, it's a God issue. It's a, it's a character of God issue. We find out something of what God is like in, in humanity made in his image. And we find uh, something of what we're like key in this. And then it's a gospel issue. When you, when you read the passages that talk about man and woman, very often, if you back up, you will see that they are passages about the advancement of the gospel. So uh, Ephesians 5, for instance. You know, wives submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Why? So you'll have ordered families and, and homes. No. Why? So that something of the mystery of Christ and his church will be displayed to the world for the sake of the gospel. And if you back up and look at the passages that talk about gender, it's not just practical details of home life. It's gospel stuff. It's showing the world something of who God is and what the gospel is in the way men and women relate. And so I want us to realize how wonderful this stuff is. It, it, and sadly, it becomes burdensome to us in figuring out the details of what it's supposed to look like. But we need to step back and say, wait, this is wonderful. God has created us, man and woman, to his glory, for his glory. 
And that's a thrilling thing to think about. Uh, and, and especially in a culture that, that is either overly stereotyping what genders are supposed to look like or obliterating the distinctions at all, saying they're mere sociology imposed on us, it's important for us to say, oh, God made us this way. We don't need to become something we're not already when he made us. We simply need to express who he made us to be in relationship with each other. So, uh, go to Romans 1. It's fascinating to me the way the gender question plays in to the glory of God issue here. Romans 1.18, Paul, you remember, starts right out of the gate talking about human depravity and our desperate need for reconciliation. Uh, and in 1.18, he picks his argument up talking about the wrath of God. Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. Humanity centrally so that they're without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God, nor give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. So, we've got this great exchange that happens. Fundamental to the human problem is this exchange of God's glory for mine. We've talked about the purpose of humanity being to glorify God, to ascribe glory to Him, to put the focus and honor toward Him, and instead of that, in our sin, we reverse that. We say, we will be glorified, you will be diminished. So Paul is making this uh, statement about what sin is, and it's profoundly theological. It's so important we're, we're making theological connections constantly in how we define things. So sin is a theological problem. It's a relational problem. It's a glory issue. Who's getting the glory from our lives? God in all his glory or ourselves? And he's saying what's happened is, is this exchange. God's glory for mine. And so what's God's response to this? It's judgment in letting that run its course, what? So what's God do in response to this, this exchange of his glory for ours? Therefore, God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. And he gets worshipful here, amen. And so Paul is laying it out. He's saying, okay, in response to human rebellion and self-glorification at the expense of God's glory, God lets that run its course, bringing about even the curse to intensify the difficulty of life in this world, to force us beyond this world to him and wake ourselves up to our horrible rebellion against the king. And then watch this. Paul says, I need to give an example of how this is so clearly displayed how this exchange of God's glory for ours is explained. And watch what he does. He goes to, to gender denial, gender distinction obliteration. Watch what happens. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men, likewise, gave up natural relations with women who were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Do you find that interesting that Paul chooses homosexuality as this, this key illustration of this sinful self-glorification at the expense of God's glory? I just find that fascinating. Actually, I took New Testament as literature at my state university. Um, 
And I was the only Christian I, I, that I know in the class, and it was just amazing to take this class. And when we studied Romans, we had our guest lecturer, who was the president of the university, who, who had some training in religious studies, and, and he came in, and, and we started studying Romans, and I raised my hand, because I honestly didn't know. And I said, why do you think in the middle of this treatment of sin, and God's glory, and His wrath, and human sin, that Paul brings up homosexuality? It was really awkward in the room right there. And I remember the president of the university, this big state university, just fumbled around, just really stymied and unsure of where to go. Well, I didn't know then, but I know now what's going on here. There's a denial of the Creator when you deny what He's intentionally created for His glory. You're saying no. No, I'm not going to live the way you've created me to live. I will determine how I express my sexuality as a man or a woman. And so what happens is, is it becomes unnatural. Now, we need to define natural here because in one sense, it's very natural for me to be impatient and angry. I've been an anger problem my whole life. It's gotten way better, and I'm impatient. It's very natural in one sense for me to be that way. But it's anything but natural from God's perspective, not what He intends in creation when He makes us. And so, so natural here means according to creation, according to how God made us, that's the intention here. And when you defy this intention in the sexual expression of homosexuality here, as, as the illustration Paul uses, He's saying it, it encapsulates sinfulness, and it encapsulates the problem with humanity. It pictures this for us. It obliterates the gender distinctions God intends for us to have in creation by which we glorify Him, and it typifies the sort of uh, self-exaltation as opposed to God-exaltation. Well, it, and if you think about it, homosexuality is this this ability I have to express my sexuality and, and to experience pleasure and loving someone sexually who's as much like me as I can possibly find. Isn't that interesting? That, that it, it's just too much of a reach for me to, to have this sort of intimacy and love expression and relationship with someone so different than me of another gender. And so I will find a way to exalt myself by actually having sex with someone who's as much like me as I can find. Um, I, I had a friend who was getting married and he was getting cold feet a week before the wedding. And I, and I said, what's going on? Tell me, tell me what's going on. And he gave me all these reasons why he was concerned about Terry. And, and I remember I said to him, Jeff, all your concerns about Terry are the main way she's different from you. And I, I get the feeling you just, you want to marry yourself in a skirt, you know? <laughs> and he didn't like that at first, but we talked through it. And I think he got what I meant, that, that there's intentional distinction here uh, that God wants to see glorify Him. And part of the, the glory comes from that distinction somehow uh, becoming one flesh in the midst of the distinction. So uh, I just find it fascinating that this is where Paul goes, that to, to the obliteration of intended dis gender distinctions uh, in the homosexual expression that he points out that was certainly alive and well in Rome. Okay. Um, so, it's a big issue, it's about the character of God, it's about the glory of God, it's about the identity of humanity, it's about the gospel. And so on page 57, we just have some notes here. Uh, you read the chapter in Grudem, uh, it digs into some passages. What I want to do is look at just some basic ideas we, we need to get on the table. The first is, we're committed to Scripture. We get so many mixed messages on, on one end of the spectrum or the other on what it means to be a man or what it means to be a woman. And it's so important that we cut through all of the, the noise to the God who made us in His perspective, to the Creator's perspective in all of this. 
He's the one who knows best. He's the one we listen to. We never go to the Bible, therefore, saying, oh, I don't like what I think I'm going to find here. Right? I don't do that with my car. When I want to find out why it's making that thumping noise, I don't go to the manual saying, oh, what? Well, I do if I think it's going to be really expensive to fix. Uh, oh, it is the transmission. Oh, no. Uh, I guess I do do that. But, but we go here saying, what does it mean for us to be men and women to the glory of God? And so we go to scriptures eagerly to find out what he says. He's the one who inspired scripture. He's the one who made us. And so we flee there for clarity. Second thing is this distinction between ontology and function. We saw this distinction where before? In the Trinity, right. That, that Father, Son, and Spirit are equal in essence and distinct in function and relationship. The primary we, way we see this eternal distinction is in function, in relationship, in, in, in functioning ability, but at the whole time acknowledging complete equality of nature and of worth and of being praiseworthy. So when we come to humanity, we acknowledge an ontological equality between male and female, a fundamental ontological equality. And the question then becomes, well, what implications does that have for function then in humanity? Well, these days there are two ways of thinking about this in the church. The first is an egalitarian view, and these are obviously uh, big generalizations. There are those who hold differing views with all sorts of nuances, but just for the sake of, of basic definition, an egalitarian says men and women have equal essence, equal ontology, but without any necessary divinely intended role distinctions. So, men and women are of equal essence with no intended difference in function. The complementarian view says also that there is equality in essence, but with intended divine differing in function. So this little box sort of unpacks these two perspectives. Now, again, to reiterate the ontological equality of men and women, as we saw in creation, men and women are equally made in the image of God and therefore equally worthy of, of respect and protection and honor and value with not a hint of difference in that sort of equality. Um, th that also means men and women are equally fallen, equally sinful, equally depraved. Uh, and even though if you hung out around my house, I would give you more evidence that I am more sinful than my wife, I know for a fact that's not true because the Bible tells me that's what's true, even though you could garner quite a case for the contrary. Um, and I could probably build good evidence even walking around this campus that, that um, it's in, unequal when it comes to fallenness, uh, tilted toward the male side, but uh, that's not the case biblically. Men and women are equally fallen and men and women are equally redeemable and equally redeemed in Christ. And so have equality in that sense, uh, equally children of God by faith. Now, the egalitarian uh, perspective will say men and women are created equal and disorder and hierarchy and role distinctions are the result of the fall, but we have restored equality and the expression of that through um, no difference in role distinctions through redemption in Christ. So. In Christ, there's neither Jew, Gentile, slave, free, male, nor female. And that means for the egalitarian, that translates into role distinctions uh, being done away with. The complementarian view also agrees with created equality, but says that equality does not mean sameness in role in way of relating, that there's divinely intended, grounded in creation, um, uh, purpose in God making us male and female that actually is intended to be carried out functionally. Uh, these, these ways of relating in a God-honoring way are terribly disrupted and perverted and distorted in the fall, but in Christ they're not done away with, but they're redeemed. They're restored to their rightful God-honoring place where it's not only honoring to God, but good for humans when we live this way. That's egalitarian view, that's the complementarian view. Uh, okay. I think that's all I want to say. Which one do you err on? Um, I think, here's what I think. I think both views have 
have problems. <laughs> Here's the problem with the egalitarian view, I believe, starts to set often, and it, it all depends on what egalitarian you're listening to or reading or talking to, but sometimes when I talk to some of my dear friends who are egalitarians, who I love deeply and have done ministry with wonderfully, but sometimes when I listen to egalitarian interpretations, it seems like very often there's, there's a frequent desire to explain around what seems to be clearly there, and often it's done with background information that isn't in the text. So it's, I know it seems to say that there are role distinctions here, but, but if you understood the background of Corinth, you'd realize that this wasn't really a, a, um, a, a broad issue, but focused on here. And so it's not something being taught to the whole church and for us today. And so because this is so culturally expressed, basically we can do away with the principle. Where I just think that's a, 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 an interpretive precedent that's troubling to me because uh, first of all, what's, what's leading me to say that can't be what he was teaching? Well, it tends to be cultural perspectives. And so, so rather than saying this is culturally expressed, which it is, um, I need to say, yes, it's culturally expressed, so head coverings carry no connotation today. So what do I do then? Well, I take the enduring principles in this passage related to manhood and womanhood and translate them into meaningful ways into the first century. I don't do away with them because they're culturally expressed. So I, I think that can be a hermeneutical precedent, an interpretive precedent that's troubling because it enables me to say, well, I admit to the authority of Scripture, but then using all kinds of background information, I explain around what seems to be clearly there. I mean, as a pastor, I think about this. How many times can I get before my people and say to them about the Bible, I know it seems to say that, but that can't be what it says. And so this is what it really means, even though unless you study Greco-Roman backgrounds, you'll never come up with that. Now, it, we need to study background issues and contextual issues, but not to do away with enduring principles but to be able to understand what they are and then translate them into the 21st century. So I think the egalitarian difficulty tends to be an interpretive one. It doesn't mean complementarians don't have any interpretive problems, but I do think the weight of the difficulty is on interpretive principles, precedents that net set, that can open up the door for culturally defined interpretations where I end up doing an end run around the authority of scripture. So I, I do think that tends to be, as I listen, to be the, the troubling thing. Complementarians? Okay, if you do read that and you say, yeah, I, I think there's an enduring principle, not just about uh, equality of worth, but I think gender distinctions are intended to actually carry themselves out in very practical, functional, relational ways. Oh, this teaching is in the first century. Or it is in the Old Testament. And so now the complementarian has the work of saying, okay, so what does that look like in the 21st century? How do we play that out, especially in light of the fact that we've got all kinds of cultural noises uh, pushing us one way or the other, right? And so, so, okay, there are distinctions. So what does that mean in the 21st century? What, what does it mean in the way we're supposed to relate to each, other, each other's men and women? Well, if you listen to some people, it means all men are Rambo and all women are Marilyn Monroe. Is that what it means? I don't think so. I know so. I know that's not the case. Uh, well, other culture voices say, well, there are no distinctions, so what does it mean to not overly rigidly stereotype what that does look like based on cultural messages, but in either direction? And so the, the complementarian has the really difficult work of discerning what does this look like? And how do we define things like submission and authority in biblical ways so they look nothing like the abusive or, or, or tragically wrong ways the world would have us think about these things. I mean, for instance, if you're a complementarian and you think Ephesians 5 is clearly teaching that there is a difference in the way a husband is supposed to uh, uh, relate to a wife and a wife is supposed to relate to a husband, and you read, wives submit to your husbands, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. If you read that and say, yeah, she has to submit to me, that means I get my way. If you read it and think that, you have no idea what you just read. Actually, if you read it from a biblical perspective, you read that man and you say, all right, wives submit to your husbands and husbands love your wives as, as Christ loves the church. What? If you want to play the fairness game, I want to get off the bus right now. Because as Christ loves, Lord, do you know how, yes, you do know how he 
love the church, don't you? <laughs> to death. <laughs> to death. And when she despised him, not once she earned the love. Ah, oh, I mean, that is a, any man who says, yeah, get my way, doesn't have a clue what he just read. And, and honestly, if, if we're doing that, and men are loving like Christ loved the church, well, who's going to have a hard time with that? Really, I don't think it'd be a big problem if men were actually taking this seriously and loving in this way. Uh, I think women would line up to marry a guy who loved like Jesus. So, so I don't think it'd be as, as massive a problem. But instead, we, we fill all these words up, like leadership and authority and, and, and submission, with all this cultural baggage that doesn't belong in these words at all. Uh, and so, so the complementarian has a really tough job of saying, what does this look like? Because it's not a list of stuff you do or don't do, right? It's not that easy. God doesn't leave it to us. As a matter of fact, he doesn't leave it to us in a list of, here, you do these 15 things, you'll be fine. He doesn't do it that way, and it's frustrating at times. He does. For instance, let's just take one. Uh, as Christians, we're told to give self-sacrificially of our resources. Give self-sacrificially. Give to the work of the Lord. Uh, what's that mean? Well, you give. You, you give generously. Did you find that for me, please? Well, you know, you, so you feel it. Well, how much? Right, and at some point you need to say, oh, okay, I need to discern this as the work of the Spirit works in me among the community of saints to discern what does this look like? What does it mean to be self-sacrificially generous? And so, so none of the big stuff in the Christian life boil down to a list of stuff you do or don't do. And it's a relational dynamic at its core. It's, it's a matter of degree. So isn't a wife supposed to be Christ-like and loving? The complementarian will be, yes. But it's a matter of degree, isn't it? It's a matter of ultimate responsibility from a complementarian perspective, uh, where, where there is a mutuality here, but there also is a distinction in degree to which someone is held responsible for things. And the complementarian said, don't you find it interesting that when Adam and Eve fell, who'd God come looking for? This isn't in Corinth, this is in the garden. He came looking for Adam. Now who led them astray? Eve. He comes looking for Adam. And what does old Adam do? She got me into this. She gave me the fruit after all. And what does Eve do? Satan. He, he's the blame. Everybody's passing the buck. And so, so, so the challenge, I think, is, is an interpretive one, not it, it, solely for the egalitarian, but certainly I, I do think that w that's what I find the most troubling. And, and then for the complementarian, it's the hard work of, okay, what does this look like then? How do you work this out if it's not a list of things to do? And it's as the Spirit leads the people of God, given uh, the culture we live in now, in carrying out these things. And you know, okay, if you are a complementarian, which I am, and you, and you want to work this out, sometimes I find great comfort in the fact that God made us men and women. We don't need to become something we're not already. And so it's not a matter of creating something new that hasn't been created. It's a matter of expressing what's there already. And it's interesting to me how we tend to get stuff on a gut level, even if we debate it in a classroom setting. I mean, what do I mean? Um, okay, the Titanic is sinking. And there are only a limited amount of lifeboats. Who gets them? What's everybody say? Women and children first. And everybody knows that's right. <laughs> and everybody knows any man who pushes a woman out of the way to get on the boat should be thrown overboard. You just sort of have a gut about that? Maybe you don't, but I, I think that's, that's odd. And you know, if, I, if my wife and I are laying in bed at night and we hear a noise downstairs. I don't care if she's a black belt in judo. If I turn to her and say, it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Something really wrong with that, right? And even women I submit to in my, my life, like most of my time at Biola, the provost that I, I answer to, the vice provost that I answer to, has been a woman most of my time here, and I joyfully submit to her leadership. And I, I, she, she's wise, and I try, she's great. But when Carol and I would relate, there would be something 
in her womanhood and my manhood, that would be exercised. And it, it, there was, it was beautiful. So if Carol and I go out to lunch, even though I do whatever she tells me to here at work, you know, if we leave the restaurant and it's pouring rain out, who's going to go get the car? Right? Why? It's just right. You know, I don't say, and it's not because she'll melt. <laughs> right? Or she can't get the car by herself. Or, uh, oh, you know those women, they always slip and fall in the rain. No, 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 no. No, that's not what we're talking about, right? It, it's not about competent. Oh, yeah, actually, I brought, listen to what John Piper writes in, in his book, Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. Look, listen to this. I just love this description because it gets right at all these stereotypes we have that, well, if you believe in the difference between men and women, it means this. Well, no, listen to this. This is great. Please, this is long, so listen. When I was a boy growing up in Greenville, South Carolina, my father was away from home about two-thirds of every year. Whew, he was an evangelist. And while he preached across the country, we prayed, my mother and my older sister and I. What I learned in those days was that my mother was omnicompetent. <laughs> she handled the finances, paid the bills, dealing with the banks and creditors. She once ran a little laundry business on the side. She was active in the park board, served as a superintendent of the intermediate department of our Southern Baptist Church, and managed some real estate holdings. She taught me how to cut grass, splice electrical cord, pull Bermuda grass by the roots, paint the eaves, and shine the dining room table with a chamois, and drive a car, and keep the french fries from getting soggy in the cooking oil. She helped me with the maps and geography and showed me how to do a bibliography and work up a science project on static electricity and believe that Algebra 2 was possible. She dealt with the contractors when we added a basement and more than once put her hand to the shovel. It never occurred to me that there was anything she couldn't do. I heard one time that women don't sweat, they glow. Not true. My mother sweated. It would drip off the end of her long, sharp nose. Sometimes she would blow it off when her hands were pushing the wheelbarrow full of peat moss, or she'd wipe it on her sleeve between the strokes of a swing blade. Mother was strong. I can remember her arms even today, 30 years later. They were big, and in the summertime, they were bronze. But it never occurred to me to think of my mother and father in the same category. Both were strong, both were bright, both were kind, both would kiss me, and both would spank me. Both were good with words, both prayed with fervor and loved the Bible, but unmistakably, my father was a man and my mother was a woman. They knew it, and I knew it. It was not a mainly biological fact. It was mainly a matter of personhood and relational dynamics. When my father came home, he was clearly head of the house. He led in prayer at the table. He called the family together for devotions. He got us to Sunday school and worship. He drove the car. He guided the family to where we would sit. He made the decision to go to Howard Johnson's for lunch. He led us to the table. He called for the waitress. He paid the check. He was the one we knew we would reckon with if we broke a family rule or were disrespectful to mother. These were the happiest times for my mother. Oh, how she rejoiced to have daddy home. She loved his leadership. Later I learned that the Bible calls this submission. But since my father was gone most of the time, mother used to do most of those leadership things. So it never occurred to me that leadership and submission had anything to do with superiority or inferiority. And it didn't have to do with muscles and skills either. It's not a matter of capabilities and competencies. It had to do with something I could have never explained as a child. And I've been a long time in coming to understanding it as part of God's great goodness in creating us male and female. It had to do with something very deep. I know that the specific rhythm of life was good in our home. Uh, the specific rhythm of life that was in our home is not the only good one. So what he's saying is, is those details he just laid out, you know, those aren't sort of transferable to every family. That's the way his mom and dad displayed this relational dynamic. Like paying the bill at the restaurant. No, I, I'm lousy at math and I always over tip. And my wife doesn't like that. And, and uh, sometimes my tip will be almost as much as the meal and the drive her crazy. So, she's, and so she, she does it. So for instance, all those details aren't even, but they, they're showing something going on, right? He says it's not the only good one, but there were dimensions of reality and goodness uh, that ought to be there in every home. Indeed, they ought to be there in varying ways in all mature relationships between men and women. I say ought to be there because I now see that they were rooted in God. Over the years, I've come to see from Scripture and from life that manhood and womanhood are the beautiful handiwork of a good and loving God. He designed our differences, and they're profound. They're not mere physiological prerequisites for sexual union. 
They go to the root of our personhood. I just think that lays it out so beautifully, that idea that this is not about superiority or inferiority or, or competency and less. My wife is far more competent at far more things than I am. She's got this massive palette of competencies. Uh, but at the end of the day, I, I think the responsibility falls on my shoulders uh, for, for being a dad and a husband. Um, you know, it's funny, it, even though Hollywood is so averse to gender distinctions, they, it's like they can't even help it. It leaks out all the time, right? And the best movies are the ones that often will capture even God-ordained gender distinctions displayed in beautiful ways where there's something going on dynamically in relationship where you say, oh, there's something really special about that. You ever see Spider-Man 2? Who saw Spider-Man 2? Remember, you wait two movies for them to first know who the love of their life is and then to actually express that. So it's frustrating for two movies, right? And finally at the end you think it's going to finally be expressed and she's going to marry that other doofus, right? And so Peter Parker's in his apartment. Spider-Man is just, <laughs> he's sitting in his apartment, nothing on the walls, right? It's so sad, he's sitting there. And, and Mary Jane leaves the guy at the altar, right? Because they said, you know, you can't be married to Spider-Man. That can't work, right? You'll be you know, threatened for your life, all that. It's just, you can't be married to Spider-Man. But, so she says no, and she runs out. She runs across the park in her wedding gown. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. And she bursts through the door, and she says, come on, Peter, we can do this. Do you remember? We can do this. We can make this marriage work. And Peter says, okay, yeah, finally, two movies. There we are, good. And they kiss, right? And you're like, finally. <laughs> right? And you remember what happens in the middle of the kiss? Sirens out the window. There's a bad guy on the loose. And here's the moment of testing if it can work, right? Remember what happens? And Peter looks over his shoulder. He looks back on her. Will she be strong enough and secure enough in herself and in this relationship for this to work? This is all going on in a matter of seconds. And you remember what she says? Go get him, tiger. <gasps> All right, Peter Parker swinging through the streets like never been. He was Spider-Man before, boy, but look out now, right? And, and she is just, it's not like she's like, oh, I'm just nothing, just do your thing, Peter. No, she, she's part of this as much as anything, right? It's not that she just takes the back seat. It's like the Rocky movies. You guys watch the Rocky movies? Everybody thinks Rocky's about this individual man doing the manly thing, standing at the top of the stairs by himself. No way. Rocky's nothing without his whole community. This whole community, Paulie, the priest throwing down the blessing, the kids running the streets. It's all about community. And central in that community is what? Adrian, right? <laughs> right? And, and, right? Remember in the video, hey, so he takes her to the park, the zoo, right? There's nobody else there. Right? Oh, snow. Well, maybe broke in. I don't know. But, and they're by the, t the line, in the tiger cage, right? And he says, so like, I was wondering what you're doing for the next 40 or 50 years. Hey, that's a great way to propose. And, <laughs> And, uh, and so they get married. Do you remember when he gets to the end of that fight with Apollo Creed and he went the full rounds with him and it was a huge victory for him and every underdog? You know what he's saying? He's not saying, yeah, I did it. You know what he's, remember he's screaming, Adrian, right? And she makes her way into the ring, right? And they didn't notice the first thing he says to her? Where's your hat? Her hat fell off on the way in the ring. He just fought for the World Heavyweight Championship of the World and he's concerned about his wife's hat. Beautiful, just beautiful. And you know the last words of the movie? We did it. We did it. It's just as beautiful. You know, I see that in the movie and I want to sit and say, that's complementarianism, people, right there. It, it's, um, <laughs> I do. It's just beautiful. Do you know how the last movie ends? I mean, it's like that way through all of them, right? She doesn't want him to fight Ivan Drago, and she, he goes to Siberia, he's running in the snow, he's, he's got no, and she, she shows up, right? She's in a coma, remember? Give him birth to Rocky Jr. She's in a coma. And then he's like, uh, and, and she comes out of it and says, win, Rocky, win. Ding, ding, ding. And I'm doing one-handed push-ups in the movie theater because, <laughs> because it's just, well, the last movie, if you, who's, who hasn't seen it? Oh, I'm sorry. It starts off and Adrian has died. She's already died. She doesn't die in the movie. There's not like a lot of suspense. It starts off and she's died. He's got a restaurant he runs called Adrian's. And, do you know the last line of the last Rocky movie? He's at her grave, and he says, we did it, Adrian. We did it. It's just beautiful. Horrible movie, but really, 
some <laughs> really great lines there. And so I, it's interesting to me that Hollywood gets this and puts it out there for people and something resonates in us. Even though we have, may have really legitimate issues and discussions and debates in the, in the classroom, there's something in life which is just sort of natural that we, we get. You know, I have a friend, Randy. He's doing everything he can to raise his kids. He's got seven amazing kids. Uh, adopted kids from, from Taiwan and kids they had biologically. But, but Randy found out one day, one of his little boys came over from school and he, he found out that his son hit a kid at school. And so he disciplined his son. Two days later, he found out that his other son hit a kid at school. And it was a girl. You would have thought the whole world had stopped spinning in Randy's household. And Randy was telling me about this. He said, you know, this is how he put it. He said, because I want my boys to know that it's bad to hit another boy. But it's really bad to hit a girl. And he said, and I also want them to know that if you hit a boy defending a girl, you get a trip to Dairy Queen. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that. There's something you hear that and you say, yeah, that's right. Uh, so, um, yeah, and, and this doesn't start when you get married. I think it starts when you're conceived. And, and it's tough to figure out what the dynamics look like, given different personalities and experiences and all this stuff, and not rigidly defining things with who gets to do what. And, and, but there is something relationally going on um, that I think we need to appreciate. All right, qu other questions or comments? Anything, yeah, Mark? Yeah, again, you know, I'm not so sure. Even to that extent, you can sort of make real. I have friends. Uh, I, one of the guys I played football with in college, he was our center. He's 6'8", 290. And he has a huge beard. And uh, he, was, he mowed lawns for a living. And his wife was a high-powered lawyer in Chicago. And when they got married, um, Trying to make ends meet in Chicago was going to be really tough if Rick kept mowing lawns. And so <laughs> this big, burly, manly football player dude stays home with the kids. And, and it's funny, he'll go to play group and he'll put a porch on for the ladies because her husband's at work all the time with the ladies in the playgroup. He'll put a porch on, but he'll also say, you know, fleece is on sale. And, and so he's, he's, <laughs> he's saying, you know, he'll be at the mall, you know, and people will go, oh, with the kids and go, oh, daddy's day out. And he'll say, Every day's daddy's day out. So, so you know, I'm, I'm not even sure. I'm not even sure you can do hard and fast deals like that. But because it is primarily this, um, this relational dynamic. But I will say, it's a tragedy to me that a woman who does stay home with her kids and doesn't aspire to be an astronaut is somehow selling out. I mean, there was an article written a couple years ago by a woman who said that anyone, any woman who decides to be a homemaker as her chosen vocation is a sellout in doing something immoral because she's inhibiting her human flourishing. <gasps> and you know, we have a friend who's a wonderful stay-at-home mom and she, she dropped her kids off one day and this, this uh, you know, administrator in a business suit walks by Kathy and says, oh, are you one of those stay-at-home moms? with a sort of patronizing little zoo animal. Oh, are you like a chinchilla? Would it? And like, uh, <laughs> it, but that's, you know, it, it's somehow you've sold out if you do what people perceive as this old school way of doing things. So I'm, I'm not sure you can make sort of rules. Of, for instance, Donna was the main breadwinner for a long time during grad school when, when we were in grad school. And, and so uh, I don't think I was selling out then. So it's not hard and fast, but there is something that our manhood and womanhood should just lead to. And, Overplaying the nurturing thing, actually men can use that as an excuse. You know, the, there's this wonderful orphan care thing going on in America, and it's usually the men dragging their feet in that. It's, it's almost always the wife who wants to adopt an orphan and the husband who doesn't. And he takes him two years to get his act together and say, yeah, we need to do this. And what happens is men say, ah, honey, that's your, just, just your nurturing instinct. Well, one, I would say, where's your nurturing instinct? And two, buddy, where's your rescuing instinct? If you're walking by a burning building and there are kids inside and your wife says, go save those kids, you're not going to say, that's just your nurturing instinct. You're, you're going to go do it, right? 
And, and so something wrong with you if, if that, there's not a manly desire to, to rescue and protect and, and take the brunt of that if need be. Um, and it's not just in burning buildings, it's just in life in general. That a complementarian view that, that I would hold to would say that. All right, well, others, yeah, great. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I compliment, most complementarians would say that, that women should preach and need to teach and need to, to, to have an authoritative, prophetic voice in the church, and, but then would say, but within the order God has prescribed. And so just the act of teaching or preaching, I don't think most complementarians are going to have a hard time with. It's just in what context, and is there an authority challenge in that? Where, where God says, I entrust the ultimate authority of a church to male leadership, and, uh, and, and so you, you cultivate all the teaching and preaching uh, uh, gifts in women, but within that order. And so it's not just the act of preaching or teaching, it's, it's within the order of relationships in the church and the family that play that out. Dave? I we're actually called to be a pastor. What's that? Yeah, see, is that that's a subjective thing. That's a subjective thing that always needs to be put through the grid of Scripture. So, um, yeah, God, I don't think God ever calls. If somebody believes there are certain roles reserved for men, you can't sort of trump that with, well, I'm called. Right? It, it, it's like, don't steal while well, I'm called to. Well, no, you can't sort of use the subjective calling for breaking a command in Scripture. So if you do believe, as a complementarian would, that there are uh, ultimate authority uh, responsibilities put on men, well, then you can't subvert that command by some subjective calling. The sovereignty of God is an issue you will talk about a lot in theology, too. Um, and so, the relationship between sovereignty and, say, election or predestination or even evil is something that you camp on in theology, too. What I want to do is I want to talk about providence in light of the doctrine of God and the doctrine of humanity because I think that's so important. So when you go to theology, too, and you talk about election, predestination, sanctification, redemption, all these issues where sovereignty and human freedom and choice come into play, well, at that point, you better have a backdrop of the doctrine of God and the doctrine of humanity so you already have a sense of how God works in general with time-bound, finite reality as an eternal, infinite God. See, that's the background issue that I think we miss. We rush to, well, how does God elect people? Before we think about, well, what are people? And who is God and how does he work? And so uh, I, that's what I want to do. I want to back up and consider the doctrine of providence that you read a chapter on in light of uh, God's character and human nature. Okay. Um, like I said, I, I want to think about providence in light of God's character. And what we're getting back to now is this thing we talked about during the doctrine of God, that God is the great I am. Remember? And he's relating all the time to time-bound, time finite creatures. And so there's this gap between us and God. But God, since the very first second of creation, breaks through this into time, space, and human history in relationship with his people that he actually takes to its ultimate in becoming one of us in Christ. And so he is both the great I am and the God of our fathers. So... That's what we're talking about now, God's transcendence and imminence, in other words. So God is transcendent, which means he's infinite and independent and immutable and sovereign, all transcendent, above us, beyond us qualities. Passages like this, he's, exa ah, he's exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops to look on the heavens and the earth? Psalm 113, he's high, exalted, lifted up. Acts 17, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he's Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, neither is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all life and breath and all things. Remember that, because we're going to get back to it and see imminence in a couple minutes. 
Isaiah 55, his ways, his thoughts are beyond ours, as high as the heavens are from the earth. He's, he's above us. He's this great I am. So he's infinite, independent, immutable, sovereign in who he is as God. Now, he's also imminent. Not with an I, with an A. That's a space relation. He's with us. He's near us. He, his transcendence never makes him out of our presence. So he's infinite, but he's personal. He's without qualitative limitations, but he has personal qualities. And you can say things right about him and wrong about him, and you can know him truly and know him personally, even though he's infinite. So he's independent. He doesn't need you, but he's profoundly relational in who he is in the Trinity in, in the way he relates to his creation. He's immutable. He never changes, but he's responsive. He doesn't change in his being, perfections, purposes, and promises, but... He hears the prayers of a righteous man and responds to them. He's responsive. He's sovereign. He's the king over everything, but he's engaged with what happens. So uh, he's the king. He determines everything that happens, but a man reaps what he sows. And so uh, we, we hold both of these in their proper tension. So imminence taught in passages like Jeremiah 23, 24. Can anyone hide in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth? Now, remember we said Paul in Acts 17 at the Areopagus says, God does not dwell in temples made with hands as though he needed anything. But then look what he says in the same breath. Though he's not far from us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your poets have said, we are his offspring. Luke 12, God says that he has the hairs of our head numbered. And... And he cares for more, far more for us than, than many sparrows. So we've got transcendence and imminence. We've got passages that teach God's transcendence and imminence beautifully packed into the same passage. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. So he is both holy, distinct, and superior to everything in creation, but the world is filled with his glory. Psalm 95, the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods, Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture. Can you see the greatness of God, the majesty of God, and the very withness of God in his imminence? And then look at Isaiah 57, 15. This is what the high and lofty one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy, I live in a high and lofty place. So transcendence, right? And you expect him to say, so don't expect me to come anywhere near you, lowlifes. That's not what he says. Look, but also with him, who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Guys, there's something wonderful going on here. God is high and lifted up, but he's with us as well. And actually, who are those who get to experience God's withness most? Who is it? People. And which, which kind of people? Lowly ones. Humble ones, contrite ones. And in the Bible, who are the people who are humble and lowly and contrite? Fundamentally, who are those people? Yeah, the ones that seek God and see Him as high and lifted up. It's so counterintuitive, isn't it? We think to know God and be close to God, we need to get up to His level or bring Him down to ours. But no, it's the people who see Him as most lofty and therefore are most contrite who get to experience Him. It's just a beautiful principle at the heart of communion with God in the midst of affirming transcendence and imminence. Okay, God's transcendent and imminent. We need to hold these in their appropriate biblical tension. And good biblical worship doesn't compromise either transcendence or imminence. That's why hymns like, Be Thou My Vision, have lines like, High King of Heaven, transcendence, right? My treasure thou art. He's, he's, he's my treasure. It's personal. He's close in the midst of being the high king of heaven. So prayer and worship and Christian living that gets this is, is truly Christian and truly biblical. Now, if you, though, read your Bible and say, yes, there is this biblical tension, and I want to do everything I can to not compromise either transcendence or imminence, but I want to read the Bible and emphasize what it emphasizes, in the way I synthesize these things in tension. Well, 
If you read the Bible and say, as I read the Bible, I think the Bible puts the emphasis here in the midst of not wanting to compromise this. So however I think about this mystery of an infinite God relating to finite creatures, of etern eternity stepping into time, I need to do it in a way that emphasizes what the Bible is. And if you read the Bible and you say, you know, I think the emphasis is on God's sovereign transcendent majesty as he works out very real relationships. And if you do that, if you start there in your emphasis, I would call you an evangelical Calvinist who's working really hard not to compromise imminence but says but as I read the Bible I think the emphasis is here if you read the Bible and you say you know what I believe God could have put the emphasis there in the way he relates to people and and that ends up being the final determiner of everything but I think God in his sovereign freedom has created a world uh, where he so valued the kind of relationship that I think he needed to value and see I see in the Bible that uh, I see the emphasis here. I think God has created a world where the emphasis falls on the human decision, the human free choice. If that's how you read the Bible, I'd call you an evangelical Arminian. Um, and then the way you, you seek to bring coherence and summary uh, understanding to these teachings of the Bible uh, will be influenced by what this starting point and this emphasis is. If you push evangelical Calvinism too far, it falls into hyper-Calvinism. And it's important to know the difference. There is a kind of hard determinism that hyper-Calvinists operate out of, that evangelical Calvinism that's working really hard to bring imminence into it is not going to do. And you need to realize that thoroughgoing uh, Calvinists have had throughout the history of the church some of their most ardent enemies, not among Arminians, but among hyper-Calvinists who say, Charles Spurgeon, you preach with such passion, you must be a closet Arminian because it seems you're trying to convince people with emotion. Are you telling everybody God loves them? Or you're, you're, uh, how does that fit with the doctrine of election? Or you're telling uh, everyone to come and respond to God as if they, you think they have that ability when you don't know? And Spurgeon's like, well, that's exactly the point. I don't know, and I'm giving the call like the Bible tells me to. And there's something mysterious about that, but I'm doing it anyway, and the hyper-Calvinists aren't happy. So know the difference between hyper-Calvinism and evangelical Calvinism. Uh, you push hyper-Calvinism far enough, it actually ends up being something like a deism where God is so uh, detached from the world, he's not really in it anymore in any meaningful way. Well, if you push evangelical Arminianism too far, you fall into what we call Pelagianism. This heresy uh, started by a guy named Pelagius who denied original sin. He said, no, that's a violation of human freedom that will minimize real relationship. And so if you're predisposed to sin invariably, that's not real freedom. And you need to have the same chance that Adam had. And so, so he ends up denying human depravity uh, and, and original sin. And, and Arminians would see that as this, this departure from, from working hard to, to get it right. So you push Pelagianism further. You fall in, don't worry about these. Open theology, which is another progression. Don't worry about this one either. Process theology, another step in the process. But if you keep going, before you know it, you've got almost something like a pantheistic God who's so part of his creation, he ends up not being all that distinct from it anymore. It's interesting you push these out enough and you get to the sort of the same useless God. Now, I know the tendency, I know the temptation is understandable, and there may seem to be something very legitimate to it, but there's this tendency to say, well, let's then all be happy Calvinians and just sort of live here. <laughs> I'll just sort of do it, oh, whatever. Yeah. Now, there's something understandable in that, but in reality, historically, the greatest minds in the church have said, you know what, there's a tension here, and there's some very important issues to consider as we work this out. And so there are questions to be answered. And uh, maybe it's okay to say, well, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know over and over again, but these, these five tenets of these two ways of thinking have come up, page 61. Uh, you see the five points of Arminianism. They actually predated the five points of Calvinism, even though they're not as well known. But five points of Calvinism were a response to the five points of Arminianism. So free will and conditional election, universal atonement, obstructible grace, and falling from grace was responded to by these five points of Calvinism, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. And so, for instance, the, the last one, five in both boxes, once you're a Christian, once you're redeemed, once you're a new creation in Christ, can you lose that? Well, the Ar classic Arminianism would say yes. Classic Calvinism would say no. You know, the Arminian says, well, it was your free choice to follow God, and it can be your free choice to lead him. And the Calvinist says, no, God chose you, and he's going to keep you chosen. Uh, so when it gets down to, well, can you lose your salvation? If you want to be a happy Calvinian, you'll have to say, well, yes and no.
<laughs> well, which is it? Well, at some point, it's helpful to, to try to actually give coherent answers to things. You could say, I don't know to, to lots of these questions, but it's, it's helpful to try to work through. Now, I don't give this to you to label yourself and then stop having great discussion and uh, dialogue and conversation. Really, these categories are the beginning of the conversation. They, they can end up being shortcuts so we know what we're talking about and then critique them. I mean, there are a lot of three-point Calvinists and two-point Arminians and all. It's because people then nuance, but they start with these categories in, in this understanding so then they can go on and have fruitful conversations. And I want you to realize that I do think they're important aspects of this issue, but there can be wonderful Christian charity and fruitful discussion and fellowship and teaching that takes place along the way. Uh, you know, uh, Whitfield, and our, our Calvinist, and John Wesley had major debates throughout their life. I mean, really heated debates through letters and, and really were going after each other and saying really, really hard things about each other's views of this issue. But when Wesley died, Whitfield's uh, going to his funeral and somebody says to him, hey, Whitfield, do you think you're going to see Wesley in heaven? You know, based on this pretty heated debate, and he said, yeah. Uh, he says, no, I don't think I'm going to see Wesley in heaven. And people are shocked, and he said, because his mansion's going to be so far from my shack, I'll never get a view of him. <laughs> and so in the midst of heated debate, he had deep respect and love for this guy and appreciation for, for how God worked through him. And I, when I was at Wheaton, I taught a, I co-taught a class, I'm an evangelical Calvinist, I co-taught a class with a committed Arminian, far wiser and, and more godly than I'll ever be, Robert Coleman, and we co-taught a theology of evangelism class. Calvinist <laughs> Arminian taught this class together, and it was one of the most fruitful things. I was in Sacramento this, this weekend with a guy who, who was in one of those classes. He's pastor in a church now where I spoke. And, and we just rejoiced over what a great time we had in that class where Coleman and I would really disagree about things, but at the end of the day have great respect and love for each other. So that's one of the reasons I love being in a place like Biola where you have a good, warm-hearted discussion in this, in this issue that is important, uh, but not something that we should uh, fight over in a way that's unedifying. Uh, is there any way that you could talk a little bit about like middle knowledge? Uh, yeah, I would, I would actually call uh, middle knowledge or Molinism uh, a, a subcategory of Arminianism that works really hard with this idea of God's knowledge of future uh, potential choices, not even just actually ones we make, any possible eventuality. That, that really does become a, an excellent way to nuance and think about what I would ultimately, though, say is an Arminian uh, treatment because it does, in the final analysis, put the determinative factor on the choice of the, of the person. Um, and not on God's sovereign election. So it's, it's, a, it's an excellently thoughtful, nuanced perspective but though, that I would put in here. But there are views like uh, compatibilism, which is a nuanced perspective of Calvinism, that are those sorts of subcategories as well. Do you know what William Lane Craig He's a Molinist. He, he's, he's a middle knowledge guy, Molinist. And, but, but I would put that as a subcategory of here, an excellently thought out subcategory of that. I think it's, it's working pretty hard philosophically, and I think a lot of philosophers would say, yeah, we're kind of off-road biblically here, but that's really helpful. Um, but yeah. Oh, I have a bibliography at the end of, of, like on page 77. See it? See the bibliography on 76 in the intro to it? Go there. Those are great resources. And actually go read Arminius and Calvin and Augustine and the founders of these things and check your Bibles. Love you guys. See ya. Biola University offers a variety of biblically centered degree programs ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.